We're here for the overlap in focus and we are going to look back at the Carabao Cup final between Manchester United and Newcastle with Gary Neville, Shea Given and Manchester United fans and Newcastle fans and two journalists from The Athletic. Gary, start on Manchester United's performance in the final. I thought it was probably as good a um, cup final performance as you could wish to get at Wembley. Uh, I, I spoke to actually one of the United coaches in the game. They were disappointed with the fact that they didn't play, you know, the football that they would expect them to play. But I just think, how many brilliant performances do you ever see at Wembley? Just generally, I played there a lot of times with England. Played there with United. The occasion, you don't really see free flowing football. I think the fact that it just brings that more nerves. The sort of both teams are prepared like you wouldn't believe. But to manage a game in that way, to control it in the way in which they did, to show the experience that they did, I thought was an unbelievable performance. And I have to say that, you know, my, I think it's a performance that you'd probably respect in the same way as I would, thinking of it from a defensive point of view of how Newcastle at times, I mean, we were getting stats through in the second half of the game, weren't we? That Newcastle had 80% of the ball in the previous 10, 15 minutes, but didn't look like they were ever going to score. And for me, it was just really impressive. Uh, they were really shrewd and streetwise. Does that give you more belief and confidence going forward to Manchester United rather than them actually playing fantastic football, scintillating football, the fact of how they won it, you think, bodes well going forward in the future and winning maybe other trophies this season? Yeah, I, I said it a few weeks ago in this studio that this uh, Eric Ten Hag came as a disciple of Pep Guardiola. So I was imagining that we were going to see what he, we saw at Ajax, you know, lots of possession, pass the ball to death. Honestly, I'm... The last two weeks, what I've seen against Barcelona and what I saw in that final on Sunday was, for me, what I think Manchester United was under Sir Alex Ferguson, that we'd win games in different ways. It'd be electric, it could be counter-attacking, it could be resilient, it could be defensive, it could be deep, it could be compact, it could be aggressive, it could be nasty, like Martinez and Casemiro were at times on Sunday. I never want him to change the way in which we've played in this last couple of weeks. I don't want him to sort of have this vision of, of course, you play against some teams, you can play great football, maybe one of the lower teams in the Premier League at home and you get all that ball and it'll just naturally happen. But I have no aspiration whatsoever as a United fan to see anything other than what I've watched in this last couple of weeks, which is fight, spirit, toughness, speed of attacking, electricity on the pitch, that connection with the fans where you can see that there's that feeling there. To me, that is United. I, I, I don't expect or want any more and I hope that we don't go down the route of bringing in more players in the summer that take us down more of a possession path. I like the idea of like Fred, Fernandez, Casemiro in midfield, the types of players that they are, the fact that they're just all over the place. There's an element of that um, in the Barcelona game. They took risks. They took risks. They could have lost goals against Barcelona, but they could have won the game four and five. But on Sunday, it was a different type of performance. That's where you get your heads on and you're saying, right, we're winning a final. And I just thought, I, I was so impressed with that performance on Sunday. Not from a football perspective, but from a point of view of how difficult it is to win finals and how difficult it is to play at Wembley. She ate Newcastle, 68 years now without a domestic trophy. I'm sure you're well Thanks, of, aware of the numbers, <laughs> but how much longer do you think you'll have to wait? And what did you think um, about the performance in the cup final? Yeah, the performance was okay. It wasn't it wasn't brilliant. I think had Man United played Newcastle maybe six or eight weeks ago when they were flying, and I think it was at the Leicester game on Boxing Day, they blew them off the pitch, beat them 3-0. They looked really comfortable, Jamie. And then it's like in the last few weeks they've stuttered, a few draws. Obviously, they lost to Liverpool the week before the cup final. So it was all kind of like can they do one big performance in the final to actually get the result? And it just, there was moments, I think, say maximum chance with De Gea made a really good save in the first half. And then the big header from Dan Byrne just before half time as well. I felt that one of them chances had to go in. Half time, 2 1 is a different game. And for the fans as well, to give them some sort of a lift, you know, they, they were brilliant, as, as we sort of spoke about before we came on. They were absolutely amazing, the fans. And just that goal might have, might have just give the players and the fans and everyone just that belief that they might have, you know, snuck a goal in the second half. But you have to give Man United credit as well. I think, as, as Gary says, second half, they looked comfortable. They looked like they enjoyed defending the, and the shape they were in. Martinez, Varane, and you mentioned Casemiro. They were just, they were enjoying clearing it, heading it, blocking it. And we got a bit desperate then, I think, as, as from a Newcastle when Longstaff had a shot from 35 yards or whatever. We didn't look like we could break them down. And, and, and that's the disappointing thing, I suppose, from the fans' point of view, is had we sneaked the goal, you know, would that have changed the, the, the outcome of the game? I don't know, but it would have given the fans something to you know, talk about. Do you think if this season peters out now and you, you don't get top four, do you think you'd look back on it as a disappointment considering the position that you've well, found yourselves in? Pro probably at the start of the season, if you had a, if you had a said top six to me, I would have snapped your hands off and get the cup final. Of course, we would have loved to get a trophy. That's That goes without saying. But 
they're in the Champions League position for so long this season, it, it, it will feel a bit like a disappointment if they don't finish in the Champions League. But at the same time, if the club gets in the top six, they're in European competition for, for next season. And again, it would be easier if they're in Champions League to attract the players. We always talk about the northeast of England, it's harder to attract the players. But I don't think that'll be the case when when this snowball effect happens because the owners were there at the weekend at the cup final and, and I was actually sitting quite close to them and they were all emotional. You had a good seat, didn't you? Huh? You had a good seat, didn't you? I was actually working for the EFL, would you believe so? <laughs> they put me in the, the Royal Box with being an Irishman, I done well sneaking in there. But um, no, I mean, and you could see after, even at the end, the, the, some of the owners were actually filming the Newcastle fans, you know, in the last couple of minutes, knowing the game was gone. But the, you could see the emotion in their faces was like, this is a real club. They've got the fans right behind them. We, we're right behind them. And you really feel that they, this, this new ownership, they're going to really get behind the manager, support the club, and I think move the club forward. And I think it's not going to be, what is the last final? Is that 99? It's not going to be 1999, you know, 20, whatever years, till we see Newcastle in the final again. I think it's a matter of time. Shay, can I ask you a question about, because obviously, I mean, I, I was aware at the end of a game of the Newcastle fans and not even having the opportunity to you know, celebrate a goal. Yeah. Do you think Eddie Howe could have done anything different during the game to try and win... The yeah, game, I'll try I don't know. And, I mean, Wilson like, looked a wee bit. Wilson looked a bit quiet on on Saturday. And the question mark before the game was Isak. Would he have started the game? Would that have been a little bit different, perhaps? Obviously, the big talking point before the game was Carius playing in goal as well. Nick Pope was out, of course. Um, could he have done much different? I'm not sure. Looking at the bench, that's probably where you look at the squad and the depth of the squad at Newcastle. Probably 11 really good players, but then behind that, they've got one or two, not six or seven. You know, Man United you look around the bench. He made five or six changes and. Probably Ten Hag, one of his strengths this year, has been making the changes at the right time to change games and stuff. And I think if we want to be at the top table for, for the next 10, 15 years or whatever it is, we have to have strength and depth. We have to have a stronger squad. And I think, realistically, you're four or five, maybe even six top, top players away from that. OK, I want to bring Adam and Joe in, Manchester United fans. Obviously, it's been a tough time for a few years, certainly on the back of last season. How impressed have you been with the manager, the players, where it feels like there's been a massive turnaround just for maybe six months, and it feels like Manchester United are back where they should be, and it looks like it's positive going forward. I mean, massively, yeah. Like we, we spoke about it last time, how it seems like he does things consistently, like he's talked about as being the sort of disciplinarian, but really, all he's saying is don't turn up late. That would be expected at any job in the country. It's not a you know radical, I can't believe he's implementing this thing, but to do it with Rashford and Ronaldo and uh, Garnacho in pre-season as well, he set his stall out as someone that <coughs> isn't going to sort of falter from these points um, and no matter who you are and I think that that sort of discipline but that consistency with it and it seems fair there's a fairness to to his discipline which I think uh, makes everyone sort of settle down and go if you're late you know what's going to happen if you don't turn up you know what's going to happen no one is under any illusion of well it's different because it's him or it's because it's him you just know here's what you have to do and if you don't there's going to be issues and I think that's been a, a sort of perfect foundation to build up this success from um, especially with what we saw last season. Adam what, what game was it this season where you felt this this guy is the right guy so we know it didn't start well but and of course you'd expect Manchester United to win games but was, was there a moment in the season when you thought I think we might have the real deal here. I don't think it was a game I think I've always had confidence in his ability as a coach and getting the best out of a football team and the players around him the one thing with United is, are they going to grasp the club? Are they going to be able to take that pressure? And I think one thing that he's always had, I noticed it on pre-season because we went out on pre-season as well, he's always seemed to have control about everything, whether it's on the pitch in terms of his team and his tactics and the changes that he makes um, in terms of substitutions off the pitch with Ronaldo, Maguire. Mm -hmm. Everything seems to suggest control. You look at some of the managers we've had over the years, you know, Moyes kind of looked like he was scared to be Man United manager. And then Mourinho comes in. I don't want to criticise him too much, but he was like, it was, he was separating himself from the club almost. And this is a guy that's embedded himself in. He keeps saying, yeah, and we've got a banner. That, <laughs> we've got a banner at Old Trafford and it says, it's glory and honour, the great man said, there's nothing on earth like being a red. And he said it in like two interviews this week. It's all about glory and honour. And there's such easy little things, but it's like, He's soaking in everything around him. Gets the fans um, on side. He's, he's getting the fans on side with the easy little wins. He's got his, his team on side. And I know Gary kind of alluded to his tactics and stuff. And I've, I've been impressed by not only his tactics in, in, in possession sometimes and, and, and the moves that we make, but his ability to change things. The, uh, I can't remember what game it was. He makes the change quickly at half time. Anthony comes out on the right. Mm. We win the game. And it's just the ability to spot things, make those changes. I think tactically is great. And... He just gets it. I, lo I love him, I do. I yeah. absolutely love him. I, I think, Joe, something. I mean, we, I, I sort of said this yesterday on social media. I, 
there are times when Jose was at Chelsea and he makes substitutions and, and Sir Alex would do the same thing and you think, what's he doing? And then it'd work. Ten Hag's done that now, mm. I think, five, six times in the last two or three months where he's made substitutions, even on Saturday and Sunday. I was absolutely certain that one of the midfield... I, I didn't think so bits and McTominay would come on. I thought he'd bring um, a wide player on, Ganacho or Sancho, and a midfield mm. player. I, that surprised me. But then it just got United... Control. Newcastle were having the best period around that time. It got Manchester United back in control. And we started actually counter-attacking from that point. Every time he makes a substitution or a change of system or he moves players' positions around, it has a massive impact. I think he's done it in the last seven or eight matches. We tracked it before the final. It's like six, seven matches he's changed the positions of the front three or front four within the game mm. to actually make the team better. Well, when do you think it's hard to do well, that? Like Redhorse, God love him, he, he works his balls off, do you know what I mean? He, he, he grafts and everything, but he's not the best striker in the world, do you know what I mean? He's not going to get you 20 goals a season. He's not going to get on the end of everything, unfortunately, but... He kind of noticed that, pulls him deep, puts Rashford a little bit further forward and it just worked and it was like, hold on, Vout Vegos is a number he 10 played, now. He right? played Vegos number 10 in the, yeah, new, yeah. in the new camp. I mean, you don't do that. <laughs> no one does that. No Manchester United fan or coach in this country is putting Vegos number 10 <laughs> in the new camp and he did it and it the, the, worked. The, the, the thing that stood out for me is, before he came in, Steve McLaren was obviously a manager in Holland and Eric Ten Hag was his assistant. And he's quite open about the fact, Steve McLaren, that he said, when a game wasn't going well, he'd just say to him, what do we do? Mm. And he'd just have a plan straight away about what they need to do, change a system, change a player coming off. And we said at half-time, and it, it's not being clever after the event, because it seems like a, an easy decision, but when you're the manager in that dressing room at half-time, and you're winning 2-0, everything's going well, and you still bring a player off. Because we, we said at half-time, the only way United are going to lose this game is if they go down to 10 men. Mm -hmm. And he brings wan Saka on, Dallow comes off. Now, most people might say... It was an obvious one that he was on a yellow card, but we've seen managers in the past. I think there was a game where Ollie should have brought someone off in a big game. I think it might have been Fred. Fred ended up yeah, getting sent off in the game. Yeah. And it was just these little decisions make a massive difference. But I just wanted to ask you the last question on that. You've won the Carabao Cup, but you, you won an FA Cup under Louis van Gaal. You won this competition mm. and a Europa League under George Mirren. Why is it different? Is I think when you feel the, the football is the thing that we want, he hasn't sacrificed the league campaign for starters as well. I think that's something that Mourinho did. He kind of sacrificed the league campaign. Um, it just feels like he's building something where the ultimate end goal is we're going to be challenging for the league title. Mm. If you give him the resources that he needs, we're going to get there. And I don't think it's ever really felt like that. Van Gaal won an FA Cup same day he got sacked. It never felt like this was the start of something. And whilst I did, I remember at Stockholm, I looked at Mourinho and Pogba on the pitch, funnily enough, and thought, oh, something's going to happen here now. And it never did. So there's always that danger. But he just feels like with his attention to detail with the youth, with his attention to detail with his signings, and not just his signings either. There were players that we had written off at this club. Yeah. Luke Shaw, Almost. Aaron Wambasaki, you just mentioned him. Diogo De Lowe, De Haya, Fred. The Haya, Fred. It, Fred's still, I think we could still improve on Fred, but yeah. he's, he's still, he's still Rashford. grafting. And Rashford, he scored five goals last season. Everyone was writing him off. And now he's back to where he needs to be. So... I think it's it's what he does with everybody that not just the signings, the players he's got, the academy players, he's got a plan. We, we should retain our calmness because of what's happened before, but to deal with Harry Maguire, Sancho, Ronaldo, the the the, the, the poor transfer window chasing Frankie De Jong. If you remember when we went back into that position, we walked into his office, literally in the midst of a, a massive crisis where Manchester United fans at that point were angry, angry on the pitch, angry off the pitch. Nothing was going right, and I can't believe what he's done in six months. I cannot believe what he's done. Well, actually, now when you're saying you can't believe it, another thing that you can't believe is that Man United may win the title. Laurie, do you agree that Manchester United <laughs> are in a title race? We've said it before on our podcast, yeah. Let's say they're in a title race. Um, Carl's giving me the... Yeah, he's, he's saying no. We're just back, happy back to get top four wrapped up, man. That's I, it. I, I, happy to get 40 points <laughs> to the board and avoid relegation. I, 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 th I think Arsenal and Man City have shown fallibilities, but they probably have. Arsenal, the last two results have been really impressive, coming back against Aston Villa and then grinding it out against Leicester. I think they've perhaps reasserted themselves as, as the dominant um, sort of force in this league at the moment. But I don't know, it's it, has got something special and this group of players have got something special. I was at his press conference just now and he touched on the fact that even though the, there's lots of games, they look like to be a few tired limbs out there at Wembley, players want to play each game and that momentum, I don't think you can discount it for the effects that it can have.
How close do you think you are to winning the title? Do you think because this season's gone so well now until you, you finish third and it's really close in terms of points total to an Arsenal or a Manchester City, do you think it's next thing where it's maybe you buy Harry Kane and you can win the league? I don't think it's as simple as that, but I do think the recruitment in the summer is going to be huge because, as Adam's touched on, Wout Vegos being you know, United centre-forward for 12 games now, it is, you know, he signed on loan. It was kind of like, you know, where did that come from? Anthony Marshall being injured still, he's not going to play against West Ham either. Um, so that is going to be a huge area to address. Financial fair play regulations are an issue. Obviously, with the ownership we can perhaps touch on, um, that might change things, but um, they aren't going to be able to go out and spend a load of money right now on, on a Harry Kane or a Victor Osman. That Osterman. wouldn't change with the ownership, would it? Because they can't bring more revenues in or profit, so that wouldn't yeah. change. You would still be bound, like Newcastle's owners are bound by financial fair play as well, aren't they? So I, so I still think that recruitment's going to be essential because, I mean, Ten Hag's shown that he's got an eye for a player. I mean, you know, Lisandro Martinez, you know, I doubted him, but he's, he's come <laughs> through into this situation where he is a, a crucial component of this team. Well, do you think him and Varane are now the best centre-back partnership in, in the Premier League? I think so because yeah, you look you look at the others. I mean, City keep changing, don't they? Arsenal. Saliba and Gabriel have been pretty good. Yeah, they have been. I, I don't know, but I just think with Varane and Martinez, you've got that kind of that still can steal. You, they've got they can do both. You know, the right and the left footed it brings so much balance and the, and the character. I mean, you know, you've got Varane who's won four Champions Leagues. Martinez you know, plays every game like it's his last, and, and they celebrate the kind of the mundane aspects of defensive work, which is something that Ten Hag's clearly instilled in them. You know, the discipline off the pitch, it, he also, it, it has a very clear correlation with what goes on on the pitch, because if you don't make that tracking run, you might be out of the team. So, and they celebrate, you know, Casemiro uh, shepherding the ball out for a goal kick, you know, and they're all, you know, chest bumping each other and psyched <laughs> up for it. It's like, it's, it's not a goal. It's not yeah. a wonderful strike. It's, it's a piece of defensive work, but they seem to take a lot of pride in it. Football fans so easily impressed of it. Just, <laughs> just, you know, just slap your badge a little bit and get us. Carl, I did, that for, 15, I did that for 15 years. That's all I did. Just hold your badge. <laughs> 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 <Fashion, laughs> exactly. <laughs> Carl, Laurie's just mentioned about maybe a Harry Kane figure, a centre forward coming in. Have you got your ear, your ear close to the ground about transfer <laughs> targets for Manchester United? Uh, Laurie's uh, more inclined to talk to agents than I am. I tend to sit in the data truck. And go, well, who should they be looking for then in the data truck? Oh, well, uh, Laurie's <laughs> mentioned Victor Oshman, and I think I'm speaking as a Ghanaian man here, so this pains me to say, but that Nigerian striker is very, very, very good. Um, he'd be very hard to extricate from Napoli. I mean, they're far and above the best team in Serie A at the moment. Napoli's owners are prickly in the transfer market as well. Uh, and negotiations. So if, if someone was to try and buy someone like Victor Oshman, he'd cost something around 100 million plus. Uh, I think there's probably two other strikers in Serie A who are pretty good. Uh, Marcus Thuram is available on a free this summer. And I'm sure more than one Premier League club will want to buy him. There's also someone else in Germany I like a lot. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've, I've looked at a lot of Ten Hag games. Uh, his Ajax time, his Utrecht time, his go-ahead Eagles time. And I don't think he's a Pep Guardiola disciple, Gary. I think he is the... He's an atypical Ajax manager in that, as you've seen through his work of Vat Vekos, he's not afraid to pump up to the big lab, as you saw now you Sebastian Aller. The reason why he was so effective in Ajax and why he was different from someone like Frank de Boer or Peter Bosch or whatever is that the Dutch form of possession football, while it's quite all well and good when you're in charge of Ajax, can be a bit tricky when you go to Europe and other teams. Are but he tried it in the first two games, didn't no, but he? You yeah. would, but you wouldn't expect Newcastle United, the way they play under Eddie Howe, to have more possession of the ball for large parts of the games against us, would you? you would ne I would never have expected... Yeah, it's you final. Would. You would? It's a, well, you'd, have ex you'd have expected Manchester United on Sunday to have 20% possession for large parts of a game. Because yeah. Ten Hag, the, the, main strength no of this, the main strength of this Manchester United team, the re like one of the big differences between Ten Hag's United and Ole Solskjaer's United and Van Gaal's one and, and Ole's one is counter-pressing, is what you do when you don't have the ball and how you win the ball back I get that, but very he, quickly. He, he, that's not his preferred style if you speak no, to him. but it's a cup final. And, and if you, he's very flexible. He's very flexible. Yeah, and I, I, I watched his cup final wins when he was at Ajax as well. And, you know, you've got someone like Casemiro who's openly said finals aren't for playing football, finals for winning games of football. And this is the time of year where managers use the words like suffer and sacrifice. And Ten Hag's been saying it's a lot more. He was saying, we're going to have to suffer and sacrifice and do all these sorts of things. So yeah, there was no surprise in my mind that we're going to be 10, 15 minutes where you like weren't going to have the ball. But also when you've got Casemiro, Rafael Varane and Sandra Martinez as that triangle, have the ball. 
Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Yeah. This, what I would say that let's not forget the Casemiro coming in. He's been absolutely fantastic. Oh, yeah. The initial idea was Frankie De Jong is a completely different player. Mm -hmm. So the idea when he first came, yeah. let's not pretend that his idea I wasn't to play out from the back. I, I saw that in the first two games and he had a goalkeeper who couldn't play from the back. And what he did in that Liverpool game was he went long at the yep. game at all. So that was only the third game. And I love the fact that this manager had come in with an idea of how he wanted to play. We saw that mm -hmm. in the first game against, I think it was Brighton. Yeah. Then Brentford using the goalkeeper a lot. Ericsson we know he's not comfortable. Ericsson was playing. Ericsson was playing the holding role. He wanted Frankie de Jong to get the ball there and play through the lines. He's gone with a different player and it's almost become a different type of team. That's I would exact, say Manchester United. That's United. exactly why he's a different Ajax manager to the likes of the board, to the likes of Bosch, to the likes of... I mean, Schroeder is completely bottomed out because he's trying to play what we all think Ajax football is. Whereas Ten Hag was always, look, there's Ajax football and there's also the modern style of football that the other top managers uh, yeah, are All I was saying before is I hope he doesn't think he has to change back to how he mm. came with the... I hope he stays with what this is because this is what I oh, like. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it, I think it's what United fans like, that, that speed, that aggression. He said after the, way the Barcelona game, the most important thing is speed. He likes, he likes playing with yeah. speed. He says he likes playing Just with glory. Just going back to his signings in the summer, I, I, I feel like Ten Hag is not going to sign. Um, and if new owners come in, they're going to want to make a statement. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to sort of, if you like, you know, blow the transfer market open. I don't think that'll suit him. I think he'll want those younger, hungrier ones that have still got that growth rather than what would be the sort of finished article that obviously we've obviously seen, you know, Barcelona. He had a little go in the summer. He spent 250 million. No, <laughs> and, and Joseph, I, I, I get that, but, you know, I get that. But, I mean, obviously, Casemiro is sort of defeats that a little bit. But you look at Anthony and you look at um, Lissandro Martinez, the hungrier and younger, whereas I think that that's the type of player he'll want to add to this squad rather than if you like, oh, Mbappe's available or so and so's available. I think Lord, Lord, come on then, give me some names. Well, I think he wants players that have a point to prove and that feel they can grow at Manchester United rather yeah. than, as you touched on there, if, if Kylian Mbappe comes, you know, <laughs> big if, you'd feel like he would, he would be doing United a favour, whereas I don't think Tanag wants no, players like that. Um, yeah, I'm, it's going to be really interesting. So I'm going to cop out, Jamie, just because I don't, I don't know. Not, you're not, not, not a saving problem. It. Not a problem. <laughs> I worked with him for about 10 years. You're not, I mean, you're not saving it for the Athletic, are you, Laurie? Come <laughs> on, you, you give, give us some of your good got, stuff here as well. We've got words to fill, you know. Um, I, I do think that, I mean, Harry Kane's been on the list for, for several seasons. And I, yeah. I do think, even though he's 29, 30, Ooh. I think he could do a really good job at Manchester United. Well, I would wouldn't love... You, wouldn't you, don't you think the better option is to get that young, hungrier striker? I think Kane's got lots of proof still, though. Yeah, exactly that. He's not young, but he's got... Career-wise and medal, Trophies, you know, not, trophy capital-wise, well, he's well, got well, as much to prove as anyone. There was a famous tweet by this man who said, <laughs> "Varane, Sancho, Kane equals the league." Mm. So if Kane comes, is that the league? Uh, do you know something? Because uh, I've worked with him, and you, what, he's gold, Harry Kane. I've said this before. He, he, he will score thirty goals. He will get 10, 15 assists, and that's an absolute fact. He's a professional. The dressing room will love him. He'll fit in straight away. And he's a guarantee for Manchester United. But if he's going to cost 150 million and he's 30, then it's a short lived. But Casemiro, there's no doubt, I, we all said it, by the way, you know, 60, 70 million quid, 20 million a year for five years is 170 million pounds investment. That is a massive investment. It's not a smart or shrewd signing when you look at it from a point of view. None of us thought that. But the impact he's having in the short term and what Manchester United need now is devastating for the club in an unbelievable way. So Harry Kane could. I think he is the type of player that could take you to the title. He is. Because he will just connect the whole of the midfield, the top of the pitch, he'll score goals. The fans will love him, the players will love him. And I don't see how you could go wrong with him. But the fact of the matter is, for the long term, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be something that works. He'll, he's got no five years left in his career, by the way, so I don't, I don't think there's a problem with that. It's just that he is, obviously, in his latter part of his career. Do you think you need anything other than a striker? I think another midfielder. I think someone... We've seen Sabitzer come in, I think he's been good and maybe that'll be a permanent thing, but I think someone... We're still kind of missing that Frankie de Jong type player. I think Ericsson's the closest Fred we've got to Fred gets a lot that. of plaudits, but he still yeah. has those, like... There's, there's games where first half he'll be bar anonymous. Bar the Leeds game. Bar bar in the second it, yeah. half to a score or something, you're like, oh, he's yeah. amazing today, where he actually <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> we still need Frankie yeah. de Jong. Yeah. Yeah. Half of people, he got booked in the end, but he could have been booked before that. Oh, he's, honestly, you can see the worst performance for a football player you'll ever see in your life in one half, and then he can be the best yeah. player on the pitch Jekyll in the second. It's Barcelona, unbelievable. It? Yeah. 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 We talk about it on the podcast, good Fred and bad Fred. This yeah. is like a Jekyll and Hyde thing. <laughs> Casemiro is a settling presence when he's next to him. But yeah, I think Manchester United probably need a midfielder next to Casemiro. I definitely think right back could be improved. Right, The white ring situation probably needs either a backup. Goalkeeper is... Mm. 
going to need to be sorted out sooner Jack, or later. He, he made a telling point, though, tonight after the game, I think it might have been talking to you actually, Gary, where he mentioned De Gea in his list of leaders. So he mentioned mm. Casemiro and Varane. Mm. And, and he wasn't in the question, De Gea, which I found, is that a telling sign of, of where you're actually now settled on? Because he, he still can't really play out from the back, but has he, has he kind of gone that pragmatism route again? I think so. so. Sorry, are you going to keep the hair then? Mm. Or you want to keep the hair? Do you want to get rid of the hair? What, what, what are you saying? <laughs> I'm, I'm you saying that. What are you saying, Shay? You're a goalkeeper. Shay, you're a goalkeeper. I'm making a goalkeeper question here. You brought me, you Shea, brought me on here for a reason. There when you you've seen, basically, the last few years, we've seen Edison and Allison, uh, mm -hmm. you know, win leagues, that style of goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. Do you think Manchester United can win a league title with De Gea in goal right now? Oh, yeah. I know they've done it in the past, yeah, but can they do it now? I actually think he's improved since Ten Hag with the ball at his feet. I think they've clearly worked that out team patterns or whatever. He has to improve. He's not. He's not Ederson. He's not Allison. Of course, he's not. He, he'd admit that himself. But when it comes to big saves, even say maximum at the weekend, like if Newcastle get their noses in front, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're going to win the final. But again, it's a massive block and a massive part of the game. And, and he makes the save look. The hair just it's mm -hmm. just a normal save. It's a great save, great block. But the question is, how do you replace the hair? Who do you get if mm -hmm. the hair's contract goes and they let him go on a free? How much will that cost to replace? How much will the wages be? I know the hair's mm -hmm. probably the highest paid goalkeeper in the league, but at the same time what he brings to the team. And the first and foremost as a goalkeeper, we all get carried away with the ball at your feet, is to keep the ball in the net. And Devin is, that, is one of that, the best. We just want to get, get on to Newcastle now. I mean, how, how would you assess the, the loss of, of Nick Pope after the games happened? Do you think it had a huge factor on the game? How did you feel Carrius performed? I think, I, I think you've got to give Carrius credit because we all remember the 2018 final and it was, Jamie, probably better than anyone. It was a disaster, wasn't it? Let's, mm. let's not be honest. You know, and that, that final will, will haunt them for the rest of his life. And, People forget the human side of it as well. He's a human being and he's been battered from pillar to post, you know. So imagine the pressure on Sunday before the game because everyone's talking about him all week when Pope got that red card. It's like, oh my God, Karras is going to have to play as if like you're getting some bin man or something or someone who's never <laughs> wore a pair of gloves Hell, before. Hell, was a bin man. He was all right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, so he's, he's, he's played regularly for Liverpool in the Premier League. Like, so you're not, you're not getting a novice. Um, was, was it, it, we, we were obviously commentating on the game and we felt he could have done better for the second goal. You're a goalkeeper. Yeah. You know more than us. I mean, were I, we a little bit harsh there? It was a difficult one, the second one, because he's, he's, I think the shot was going low or maybe it was a cross-come shot and he was actually going low for the initial mm. shot and then it took a deflection. So... I think it's it's not a it's not a error as such, you know. I mean, just maybe a, a tad unfortunate. He's gone low a bit too early, perhaps. But at the same time, who's to say Nick Pope would have saved it, you know? And then in the second half, he made some great saves. Mm -hmm. Guy talks about you know Man United in a really good shape, but they look really dangerous on the break. <coughs> and Carries made some great saves yeah. second half as well, you know. So I seen him after the game. He was he says he was happy with his performance. You know, going, was, going back to United, Manchester United and the goalkeeper. I, I went to watch Brentford on a Saturday a couple of weeks. I watched him obviously a lot. Of time. What do you think of the Brentford goalkeeper, Ray? Because yeah, I think he's going to become available. He's only got a year left. Yeah. I, I do like him. I, mean, I think he could step up. But if and you're be saying that Ten Hag wants to be the perfect Ajax manager and player from the back, or, he does not or want to be the perfect. Ajax no, no, <laughs> no, no. I'm saying like, but if, if that's if you yeah. have that impression that when he came in, it's going to be playing through the lines, playing out from the back, you know, spraying all yeah. the place like Ederson. I think someone like Ray is very, very comfortable think, with the ball. I think he's Ray like. would interest United. In but the is he a better goal I've shot got, stopper I've or got, whatever? I've got the, the head shortlist ready. I've done. I've looked at the smart scout charts. Come on, who is it? Let's educate. When I've got to write the article for the Athletic, I write the article. Oh. But um, <laughs> hold them back we again. We'll bring you on air again. You're going to keep the Athletic. Give us one name then. Ray is. Ray is the. I mean, thanks for Give us something. Thanks for that. I've just given it to you. Ray went to the Ray went to the World Cup ahead of David De Gea. It's not just David De Gea is the most expensive yeah. goalkeeper in the Premier League. He's the most expensive Spanish football player. He's the most expensive. Yeah. Like you, I don't think you can win a Premier League with David De Gea as your I goalkeeper think, in 2023, I, I, 2024. I, disagree. Anymore. I, I think, think that again shows Ten Hag's flex, uh, flexibility, yeah. though, because he's he's gone all right. Sometimes he can play out, but not all the time. So let's change a little bit. Sometimes we'll go a little bit more direct. And I think, especially in the big short, games. Well, yeah, well now you've got Martinez and Barat long every so time. comfortable on the ball. Just give it to them quickly. and then. Mm. You, but I, I, do you think the one question I wondered about with goalkeepers and Man United in particular, the focus that is on you as a Man United goalkeeper, like, you know, look at Ben uh, Foster, look at uh, other goalkeepers that they've had that. in the past. Mm. I, said, I said it's the single most difficult position in English football, being Manchester United goalkeeper. I genuinely believe that. I think Liverpool's number one is the second. And that's, that's to disrespect to all other clubs. I think the Manchester United goalkeeper comes under more scrutiny if they make a mistake than yeah. any other position in English football on the pitch. It's tough. And so, I've seen lads so in that again, goal. So again, then, it's a bit of a lottery if you bring a Raya or someone else mm. who's not used to the position. We've seen mm. keepers in the past who've wilt. That's Taibi, Taibi, remember him? That's the problem they've got. Classic, Man of the match, first well. game, the Anfield, Italian, but then yeah, yeah. But you know Southampton, what I mean? like, the CCA. Just, just went like that, didn't they? Mm. That, that's they the couldn't hack the pressure. Bartes yeah. as well. It's whether they can handle that 
that stadium, that sort of, do you know what it is? It's that, I think it's that element of that lull that they experience, you'll know it, where the team are attacking, say, at home for like 10 minutes and they haven't touched the ball mm -hmm. and they're just there. Yeah. And it's that concentration, obviously, that goalkeepers need mm -hmm. to have when they're not involved in the game. I always think a Manchester United goalkeeper, or any goalkeeper, has, has unbelievable concentration. Because you might go five minutes without touching the ball. Yeah. We're always involved out, you know, we're always involved, we're always adjusting our positions. A goalkeeper can just be redundant for a period in the game. I think that's a really tough thing to have to I think it was deal with. I mean, to swing back to characters, was telling the first, first, very first corner Manchester United had, oh, Rafa Varane basically just stood on characters. They're looking to mess him up. Mess him very much like swamped yeah, yeah. the six yard box. Like, Let's test them out for a little bit. <coughs> well, talking yeah. about obviously Carrius, Newcastle point of view, Nick Pope will be back uh, in a few games and hopefully that'll turn the form around because you've now gone four games without a win in the Premier League. How fearful are you that there could be no Champions League football next season, no European football? How quickly, how, how important is it that you get back on track? I'm not fearful that we don't get Champions League. I don't know about you, but I'm not fearful about Champions League specifically. I think we'd be happy regardless. Even if we've got any sort of European football, as Shea said, I think Europa League will be great for us. I don't think, at this point, in my opinion, I don't think we're ready for the Champions League. I think mm. we'd have to have a massive summer. Um, and I don't think that's the kind of <coughs> pressure the owners and, and everyone in the board and stuff wants to be under right now to go and everyone expecting you to sign five players and there's some more quality players as well and spend a, a big chunk of money. Um, as you said, there is restrictions and things like that. Uh, our league form is obviously concerning at the moment because it is on a downward trajectory at the moment. We're not losing necessarily, aside from the Liverpool game, which we will not mention, <laughs> our two losses this season. Um, only two losses. But yeah, I think we, it's the goals. We could have, we were saying earlier, couldn't we? We could, <coughs> could have played another five five more days. It could be playing now. We wouldn't have scored no matter what after Sunday. We just still wouldn't have scored a goal. So um, yeah, it's just hit us at a bad time. Momentum has obviously, I think, played a massive part in the league as well. So You know, when you talk about this, and I can understand where you're coming from, that we're not ready for top four, or if we got if we get top six, we would have topped that at the start of the season. 100%. But I always think football fans have this idea about their own club of if it's like almost like this plan. So we might get top six, then we get top four, and then we'll maybe challenge for a title. But everybody else has got that plan. Mm. Yeah. And this idea that we're not ready for top four, you might finish eighth next season because mm. because you've had such a great season, it might not happen for you next season. I think it'll happen eventually. Does that not worry you? It it does because I think. It, the chain of events that have happened this season as well, I think we've had like kind of a lot of things have happened where we should have capitalised, like injuries to players from the big six, if you will, um, teams like Liverpool and Chelsea not performing this season, teams like even Man City, they're still in the title race, obviously, but not performing to the levels of Man City. They're not like 20 points ahead, like, the, you know, like a big chunk ahead like they usually would. Um, so I do think obviously Man, Man United had a really bad start to the season as well. So I think where we should have capitalised, we haven't. So that, that is my concern. Um, and if you have got an opportunity at top four, I think take it with both hands. Absolutely, you you try everything to get top four. And we, we've deserved it on merit where we're based on where we've been this season. But as I say, as just in, from a fan point of view, I wouldn't be like massively disappointed if we didn't get it. I mean, I think at the start of the season, if you ever, like Shea said, if you ever offered, what, sixth, seventh in a cup final, would have snapped your hand off. You know, we've been fighting relegation every year for as long as I can remember. But that being said now, this is the best chance we're going to get yeah. top four. Liverpool's going to come back stronger. Chelsea's okay. going to come back stronger. Uh, I, we have to. We have to start winning games. I, I agree with that because if you get your Europa League, you're going to play Thursday night and Thursday Sunday. We yeah. know it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So you, you know those things and the advantages that you've got this season. We've in also terms had of, that advantage where we yeah. haven't had a, a midweek game like every other team around us has had. Whereas we would have that next season as well. And Thursdays, yeah. we're saying I, we're not I, ready sorry, for. Sorry, I spoke to Dan Ashworth in, in, in the January window. We'd done the, the game. I think it was a quarter final for the League Cup, and he, he spoke this before on Sky actually. And I ask him that question, is now the time to strengthen? Because as Jamie rightly says, there's no guarantee in 12 months that, that yeah. we'll be in the top four. Mm. Is now, I know they've signed Anthony Gordon, obviously, but is, was now the time to sign three or four players? I know there's <coughs> a fair play as well. But there's no guarantee in 12 months. You mentioned Chelsea, you mentioned Liverpool are struggling this season. Was that the time to hit the ground running, get two or three top, top players? And then in the summer, if you get Champions League football, it's an easier job to attract them because then the there's no guarantee what's going to happen down the road. I think we missed a trick this January. We didn't we hardly spent any money. If anything, we got weakened in January for me. Yeah. We let John Joe show if he go. Didn't replace him. Bruno Gomez gets suspended. Then who we put in the midfield? Chris Wood left and signed a striker. I mean, I'm not Chris Wood's biggest well. fan, but you know we've, yeah. we've let Chris Wood go and signed a winger. And, and he's Gordon, got so elements like really air really that we don't have in the forwards that we have mm -hmm. now as well. So. So Eddie Howe mentioned yeah. Chris Wood when he did sell him. He says it frees up a position now for us to sign someone. Yeah, and, we and didn't <laughs> say one, so I don't know if there was something in the pipeline that they thought it was going to come through the door, but didn't, you know. So I think maybe it, they, they did perhaps slip up a little bit in January. So. Where, where do Newcastle need to strengthen? 
in the summer? Uh, midfield massively. <laughs> we need a creative yeah. midfielder. I think we have to go all out and try and get that James Madison, that type of creative spark yeah. in the midfield to get between the lanes because for me, we're lacking that so much. If Bruno isn't there, there's nobody who's creating. We're really Jordan's in balance without Bruno as well, aren't we? Really Willick, in balance Casey midfield. gets about the pitch. We haven't got enough to connect the lanes. There's not someone to play the through balls. Uh, uh, will the Newcastle fans be next season if, if we're at this almost just past the halfway stage and you're eighth in the league or you're ninth in the league, which could easily happen because, you know, Chelsea and Liverpool you'd expect to come back mm -hmm. uh, and be stronger. There's always a surprise package every season. How would the Newcastle fans be about that in terms of, like, you know, the ownership, the manager, the, the squad that they've got? Will that patience be there because you've been, as your expectations raised so much this season? I think we've seen across the fan base already expectations becoming raised, yeah. like a, a frustration at drawing at home to West Ham, frustration drawn against Bournemouth away. Bournemouth away was a six-pointer for us last year. Do you know what I mean? And now, mm -hmm. now we're getting frustrated because it's because it's oh, it could have went fourth today. Do you know what I mean? So expectations will naturally rise. It depends on what happens in the transfer market. But Eddie Howe, the turnaround he's done, he, he deserves the time for me and he deserves patience. As long as we're seeing things on the pitch that we are at the moment, he's got to be given the time. Well, I think Eddie Howe's been maybe even the manager of the season, certainly at, at this point right now. But it was you who brought that up. How, long, how much patience would there be with an Eddie Howe if Newcastle still go maybe another 18 months without Champions League football, European football, or maybe a trophy? The interesting thing will be is if we do spend money and how he does with that, how he does with bigger name players, if you like, how he'll handle certain situations. At Bournemouth, he was sometimes uh, criticised for some of the big money signs, like when he signed Jordan Ibe for 40 million and things Dominic like Solanke that. Yeah, money, yeah. Solanke, and um, he was a little bit criticised, but I think so far. He's, he's done absolutely nothing negative for me at all that would even put him 1% in like a negative mm. category it, at the moment. It's a bit of a theme for English managers, actually. You think about sort of Frank, when he had the season at Chelsea, it was good. It was when he couldn't sign players. And then, obviously, Stevie spent quite a bit of money on Coutinho. That brought a lot of pressure. Um, Eddie Howe, when he spends money, eventually get I a lot of pressure. I think he was disappointed at January. Yeah, 100%. Graham Potter at Chelsea, the pressure he's now under because of the money being spent. I think that's an element of English management and coaching. They're gonna, they're going to have to get over that. There will be big money spent and they're going to have to get over that sort of, if you like, challenge that yeah. the great managers... and the, 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 these man I've said them before, the, monster, the monsters, mm. these managers, Pep Guardiola, mm. Jurgen Klopp, Conte, these types of, you know, of characters, yeah. they're, just, they're just, I don't know, they're wired differently. I'm not sure we're wired as English coaches um, in the same way as they are. They sort of, they think very differently, very, a lot more sort of... I think he's, throw, he's, he's the throw, best, clinical. best English manager, isn't he, right 100%. now? I oh, yeah. Say yeah. Definitely. Definitely. I think he, he just needs to have that. I just think we just need to go and make a marquee signing. I know, obviously, people say Isak is so far and things like that, but I honestly think he just need to go, we need to go and drop big money on a play and just get it out of the way, you know, like, so it's not constantly, like, a thing where... Yeah. <laughs> when you just yeah. Please, yeah. please, <laughs> please. <laughs> if you listen. <laughs> um, yeah, I think they, just, they honestly just need to do it and just get it out of the way. Like, like the elephant in the room at the moment, because <laughs> everyone's looking at us to go and spend hundred, hundreds of million pounds every window. We haven't. We've done really shrewd business, really good business, Nick Port for 10 million, Dan Burn for 30 million. I don't million. think Dan Ashworth and Eddie Howe together as a combination, they're not, they're not, they won't think that way. They yeah, won't they think they'll go won't. and get a star name for 80 million. <laughs> no, they, 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 not, they don't they think that way. Think like they'll that. think the Dan Ashworth was very much of the opinion of FFP. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. He was saying, like, we can't go mad and spend in January. Yeah. Like, Every we, interview like, they mentioned it, fans or whatever you want to call us, we yeah. wanted to go and spend mm. big money, didn't we? Bring three or four players and yeah. have a real go. But he says, we're restricted massively by FFP. Obviously, huge excitement there at Newcastle. I'm obviously got my Liverpool hat on. We've got Manchester United fans here as well. H how worried are <laughs> other teams and other fan bases about Newcastle right now? Do you, do you see them as a huge threat right now, or is that something that's going to come in years to come? If if we weren't getting rid of the Glazers, or possibly, hopefully, touch wood, getting rid of the Glazers, I'd be a little bit more worried because I kind of and, and if we didn't have Ten Hag, because. If we were sitting outside of the top four and you're trying to get in and you're going, oh, Newcastle are there, Chelsea are still out of the top four, Liverpool, and they'll all improve, it's much more difficult. But I'm hoping if we can get in this season and start to build something, it's less of a worry for us. But it's still, they're still going to be looking to take some of those trophies and there's only four trophies you can win every season. So, I think City has almost sort of blinded people to the idea that you can spend money and still fail. Because of their owners. And you should th prove that. Well, that's what I'm saying. United are <laughs> living proof that you can spend a billion pounds and win no Premier Leagues. I think people assume that Newcastle will get it right at some point because, well, City did. But City got great people in to do the jobs. United spent the same amount of money as City You've and have won no Premier Leagues, no Champions Leagues because we got the wrong people in to do it. So whilst I think eventually Newcastle um, will be a worry and a concern in terms of challenging for the leagues because the money is there, 
it, there's no guarantee that just because you've got it, you're going to win stuff. Because, uh, like I said, United have proved that. So I think it's one of those cases where they've, they've still got to get it right. It's not as easy as just, we'll spend loads of money and you'll win. Because it doesn't always work out. OK, let's finish this by you telling me where you think Manchester United will finish in the league this season. Prediction time. Like, you know what? I don't think we're going to win the league, but I think we'll finish second. Mm. I think... Ahead of uh, whoever, Ahead whoever of finishes the league will finish above us. Obviously. Arsenal or City are going to win. The league. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal or City are going to win the league, yeah. and then whoever doesn't win the league, they're going to drop off below yeah. us. That's what I've got the feeling of. I think it'll be second, but and it could be behind either of them. I don't. I, I don't know who. It'll that be. was my inkling earlier yeah. in the season. What normally happens is one team that's got so close realizes that they it. can't win it. Yeah. And then they just go like that in the last two or three heads. games. Mm. You lose two games, like all of a sudden someone else, someone else goes above you. Yeah. That kind of thing. Mm. I, thought, I thought City would win the league and United would finish second like two or three months ago. And then to be fair, I, I'm, I'm not going to change my mind on it, but I think I do change my mind in I'm the off. sense. <laughs> but, no, I don't. I don't. I still say City are going to win the league. I've stuck with it, even though I do believe I'm Arsenal, sure the, the closer it gets. But 14 games is still a long way to go. I still think United will finish second. OK. Newcastle, <clears throat> where do you think they'll finish? Fifth to me. Oh. Uh, you I'm happy with that? I'd be happy with fifth, 100%. Will you take that now? I would take If you said to me fifth, 100%, I would take it. It's, it's European football. I know, obviously, there's still Champions League to go, but, um, yeah. I think. I think that's sensible. That's that's smart. and sensible. That's what I feel as well. Newcastle could really... They could go like that. and you know, Liverpool, they're on the way up. Everyone's saying Tottenham. we're overachieving. I just think we're prem prematurely achieving, not yeah. overachieving, because where we've got is our results yeah. and how we've we've played. We, we've got there on merit at the moment. It's just... We are kind of wearing, the, you know, we always talk about the Arsenal fall off. It's, it's kind of us at the minute, so we're on a little bit of downward check. But hopefully, the, the cup final's out the way, and we haven't, we've just got the league to focus on now. But yeah, fifth for me, I think, and I'll be honestly over the moon if we finish fifth, over the moon. I think it's it's good that the cup final is finally out of the way yeah. because the form has stalled the last few weeks because of that. Okay. The players have clearly had that eye on the final, um, and I think it's going to come down to. The resurgence of other teams. I think Newcastle are just going to continue to not score enough goals and, and draw too many games. Um, just being a bit pessimistic, I just think that's the way it's going to go. I think I think we'll finish sixth. I think we'll just fall down to sixth. It'll be just too much of an ask because you look at our bench on the weekend. Like Shea said, it's just not good enough, so man. The reason we we lost that final in a way is because Man United were bringing on Jaden Sancho, yeah, well, seventy million Ritchie. pounds. We brought on thirty-three-year-old Matt Ritchie. <laughs> but no, no offense I mean? to Matt no Ritchie, because I, I love Matt. Brilliant. I love so Matt. Matt. Like, these players aren't going to get your top four. Yeah. 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 Not. Finish sixth. Who's jumping? Ahead of you in the league? I think Spurs Liverpool. and uh, Liverpool. Liverpool, Liverpool. Comes from, I think. I'm not sure about Liverpool. I don't know about Liverpool. Because Liverpool are going to get knocked out of the mean, Champions like, League now. It's going to be everything on top four. Like we're forgetting about teams like Brighton and, and Fulham and that. <laughs> <laughs> They've had <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> seasons. Brentford, they're all having class seasons. Like you just don't know exactly. Fulham, what's going to happen. Like, yeah, it's okay. just. I think top six, I think fifth or sixth. I think yeah, that's I realistic agree. for Newcastle. And I think they've had a dip. And, and hopefully. Our two fans here are right that the dips, you know, come before the final, and, and they can get back to that form whatever six, seven weeks ago because they look like oh, the Champions League's a done deal. You mm. know, around Christmas the World, time, the World were, Cup were, knocked us off completely. Yeah, like, so as I say, momentum's massive. It's like it's a marathon, not a sprint. The Premier League momentum's massive, and it just it just cut us off at the wrong any form, time, didn't any it? Any form of know. European football, I'll be over. I'll go Thursday night okay. to wait in the middle of nowhere. Me okay. too. I've got that. That's it. Pass for Fred. We know that. We know that. Go four days early. <laughs> OK, we're all done. That's the end of part one. Join us for part two when we will look at the title race between Manchester City and Arsenal and maybe Manchester United. I hope you've enjoyed our first overlap in focus at the shop bar. We've really enjoyed it. And thank you to our partners at Skybet. And I hope you can join us next time. Please subscribe.